While making the gear cutter arbor, I needed to repeatedly machine the hex surfaces into the nut with the same width. I did this by holding the collet block at the same distance from the end of the vise for each face. To make sure the distance was as similar as possible, I used this arrangement of parallels. One pressed against the side, and then the other used to define the distance from the first parallel to the block. As you can see, it was incredibly clumsy, and I want to avoid doing this again. The simplest solution seemed to be to screw an attachment to this threaded hole on the side of the fixed vice jaw, and use it to define a stop. I came up with a rough design in my head, and thought I'd make an experimental prototype. I started with a piece of 10mm O1 tool steel gauge plate. The plate faces are precision ground and flatter than I could get them on my mill, so all I had to do was clean up the edges. Having said that, O1 is tougher than any steel I've machined before, and squaring it up on my tiny Proxon mill presented a few challenges. Cleaning up the long sides was simple enough, though I had to make very shallow passes to avoid chatter. To clean up the ends while keeping the part firmly held, I decided to try side milling. This works around the problem that the part is much longer than the depth of the vise. Straight away I got a lot of resistance trying to move the material into the cutter. With each pass, the resistance got stronger, and the cutter didn't seem to be removing much material. It looked like the cutting force was pushing the cutter away from the material, and I concluded that my mill just isn't rigid enough to deal with such a large contact area. Please let me know if there's anything obviously wrong with my technique, and you have any suggestions. I made one final attempt with the cheaper high-speed steel cutter, but the result was even messier, so I changed my approach. Holding the part this way leaves a lot more protruding from the vice jaws, making it much more vulnerable to chatter and flexing. Once the stock was squared, I cleaned up the edges with this new chamfer tool. Chamfering to a consistent depth requires a surprising amount of care. The chamfers look nice and clean, but I thought a radius on the edges between the sides and the ends would fit better with the lines of the tool. Joe Pye has a great video on how to use this style of radius tool on the mill, but unfortunately I didn't follow his instructions that well, and made plenty of mistakes. The idea is to set the height with the edge of the tool just a small clearance above the top of the part. Click the card at the top right to see how it should be done. For my first corner, the edge of the tool was scraping the top face, ruining the top end of the curve. <laughs> 
second corner I set the height a little better. During this pass I noticed that the vertical axis was drifting. The deeper passes generated more vibration which broke the locking force on the quill. I moved the quill back into position and ruined the surface of the radius. Fortunately there was still enough material left to clean up the mess. The next set of drilling operations needed to be on the centre line of the part, so the first step was locating the fixture of the vise. With the table held stationary I took up the backlash and zeroed the dial. Then I moved the table the correct distance to bring the spindle to the point where the distance to the fixed jaw was the half the width of the part. The first is a threaded hole near one end. This will accept a screw which will be used to define the stop depth. The thread is M6, so the tap drill needed to be 5mm. Tapping was another job for my shop made tap follower. This steel was very hard to start tapping and really tough going. I could have made it easier by slightly enlarging the tap hole, but I chose not to as I wanted to have as little slop in the thread as possible. After a few turns the tap got so tight that I was afraid it would break, so I switched to a bottoming tap to widen out the threads I'd already established. Then I changed back to the starter tap, taking care not to cross the threads. <laughs> 
I changed back and forth between the two taps a couple of times before eventually the thread was complete. To clean up the burrs from the tapping I used this countersink tool. It would have been really useful to have a vice stop to keep the part in place when I turned it over. I didn't get the hole exactly on centre line, but close enough. The tool is to be bolted onto the side of the vise through a slot to make it easy to adjust the distance from the back jaw to the stop itself. As the slot is a large proportion of the length of the part, I was worried it might not be safe to hold it in a vise. Opening the slot might cause the part to flex and trap the end mill, so I decided to mill the part clamped to the table. The clamps all use M6 thread, so it wouldn't fit through the M6 hole I just threaded. Click the link at the top right to see how I made a custom dual threaded rod for this fixture. To make sure the slot was straight, I used an indicator to tram the edge of the part to be parallel to the axis of the table. It was tricky to tap the part into place without knocking the indicator, but after about three passes I got it to within a hundredth of a millimetre. I drilled a chain of holes along the path of the slot, half a millimetre smaller than the target width of the slot. Twist drills can remove most of the material more easily than milling, but the most important benefit of doing this only becomes obvious once we are milling. At the end of each pass, the end mill must be plunged down into the material before making the next pass. End mills don't cut well at the centre, so plunging needs to be done very carefully and can cause lots of vibration. I've drilled a hole at both ends of the slot, with the centre exactly lined up with the centre of the end mill when it reaches that end. When the end mill is plunging into the material, only the outer parts of the cutting face need to cut into the material, which makes the operation much easier and safer. Thanks to Andrew Wilson, who suggested this drilling technique in the comments of a video I uploaded nine months ago. A problem that became obvious as the operation progressed was chip buildup. This can put additional load on the cutter and mess up the surface finish as the chips get pulled back into the cutter and recut against the surface. Larger workshops clear chips by using flood coolant or a cooling spray, but these would create more mess than I can cope with in my tiny workshop. 
After a discussion with Adam Carmichael on Facebook, I tried setting up a jet of compressed air from an airbrush compressor to blow the chips clear. To direct the jet, I used a cheap airbrush, as I don't have a suitable nozzle. The airbrush seems to work just fine, and the chips no longer build up in the slot, but it'll be a fun future project to build a proper nozzle for this purpose. At this point the main features are complete, so it's time for a test fit. The pre-ground surface of the steel sits firmly against the side of the vise and seems stable. To reduce wear on the tool and ensure the best possible stability, I need a couple of washers to go between the fitting hardware and the body of the tool. I made the washers out of EN1A PB, a free machining mild steel with a trace of lead. This is softer than the tool steel, so should reduce wear at the contact surface. The first washer is for the bolt that fixes the stop to the vice jaw. This is a large face to spread the holding force to the full width of the tool. The other face is tapered to cleanly match the clamping face of the screw head. Second is a simple flat washer for the locking nut. The final step is to clean up the end of the screw that defines the location of the stop. The end was rough and had no well defined contact point, so I wanted to turn it into a radius with a single contact point for a flat surface. I didn't have a suitable radius tool, so I made a series of angled cuts and then used a file to smooth them round. This isn't a safe way to polish the end, as the thread could easily have caught the fibres of the abrasive pad and pulled it into the chuck. Thanks to everyone on Facebook who warned me about this danger. The result looks surprisingly good and should make an acceptable stop. Let's see how well it works in practice. <laughs> 
I'll start with a collet block pushed up against the stop and gripped in the vise. This test indicator is set up with the tip against the collet block face around the middle of its range. For each test I loosen the vise, move the block back, then bring it back against the stop and tighten the vise. The first result is one hundredth of a millimetre further forward than the original position. The second result is almost exactly the same position as the first, which is probably because I wasn't pressing the block against the stop when I did the initial setup. This level of accuracy is more than adequate for the intended use case and probably good enough for significantly more precise work, so I'm happy with the tool. Keep watching for more toolmaking projects and videos.